today's lesson is on me, the three-spined stickleback fish. Oh no, that giant fish is going to eat me. Ouch, this guy is way too crunchy for my lunch. Phew, that was a close one. But luckily, I have these spines to protect me. The big fish don't bother me much if they know about these. Now that that big fish is gone, I can tell you a bit more about myself. My real name is Gasterosteus aculatus, but most people just call me a marine three-spine stickleback. I live in the ocean. There are other sticklebacks that live in lakes and other freshwater places, but they don't have my nifty spines to keep away big fish. I will tell you more about how we are different later. For now, let me tell you more about me. I already told you that I live in the ocean, but I specifically like inland coastal waters above 30 degrees north. This is essentially the northern hemisphere, in waters such as the east coast of the United States, as you can see on this map. There are actually three subspecies of Gasterosteus aculatus. There's Gasterosteus aculatus aculatus, which is me, and two unarmored subspecies only found in North America, Gasterosteus aculatus williamsoni and Gasterosteus aculatus santa ana. None of us look the same, but we do all live in the northern hemisphere. As you saw when that big fish tried to eat me earlier, we stickleback, both marine and freshwater, are relatively small fish. While this does make us easy prey for big fish, it also makes it easier for us to hide. This is where the freshwater sticklebacks and I begin to differ. So let's go back in time to see how this happened. About 10,000 years ago, around the time of the last ice age, all stickleback fish looked pretty much like me, with long pelvic spine structure. Then a glacier slid down over North America, forming a bunch of lakes and rivers that lead to them from the ocean. Small groups of marine stickleback began migrating up the rivers into the lakes. When these sticklebacks started to establish new populations in the lakes, it was the fish with smaller pelvic spine structures that had better survival rates, the opposite of which is true for me and the other marine sticklebacks. Why is this, you may ask? It is because the predators in the ocean, the ones that my spines protect me from, were not there in these freshwater lakes. The predators in the lakes, such as insects, could actually use the spines to latch onto their prey. Therefore, size reduction in pelvic structure is what we call a beneficial adaptive trait in the lakes. But before we go much further, let's clarify a couple things. Just what are the pelvis and these pelvic spines? Who else has these structures? What is it, the purpose of them? The pelvis connects the spine and legs. This structure can be seen in almost every vertebrate species, but each has its own size, shape, and function, such as running, climbing, or jumping. This may be the most recognizable pelvis, since it is what you and all humans have. These bones are important for walking upright and allowing you to jump and run. This pelvis comes from a chimpanzee. Can you spot the differences? The difference in shape helps chimps to climb and is more fitting for an animal that uses all four limbs for walking. Now, this doesn't look much like the first two at all. That's because this pelvis comes from a mouse. This is more narrow so that they can fit through small openings. This last pelvis comes from a fish. You may be asking yourself, why does a fish need a pelvis? They can't walk. The pelvis is an important attachment site for pelvic spines that I'll talk more about later. So now that you've noticed the differences in the pelvises for these organisms, Remember that all of these animals evolved from a common ancestor. That's why they all have a pelvis, but each has developed the right structure for their species. Hey everyone, I'm a freshwater stickleback and I'm here to talk to you about DNA. As many of you have probably learned in class, DNA makes up the building blocks that help make each of us into what we are today. These different molecules, called adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, make up DNA. These different molecules come together in different combinations to make instructions known as genes. These genes can then tell the body what it needs to do. The gene we're interested in here is known as PITX1, and it's the instructions that tell the body how to make the pelvis. Check out this candy claymation that you guys can try at home if you want. Watch how the marine and freshwater stickleback spines grow. You may notice that the freshwater spines, they grow a bit in the beginning, and then they stop while the marines keep growing. This is that beneficial adaptive trait we were talking about earlier. Next, we'll talk about how the scientists cross the fish 
so that they could observe the pelvic spine phenotypes. So let's put it all together. Our friend the fishwater, freshwater stickleback told us all about DNA and how it tells our body how to develop, and then showed us how pelvic spines grow on freshwater and marine fish. Then some scientists came in and asked what the pelvic spines from children of marine and freshwater fish would look like. Think of their experiment this way. Think about it as mixing colors. If you mix red and yellow, you get orange. Well, if you mix marine and freshwater, you get something in between, just the same way. So if you took a marine fish with large pelvic structures and a freshwater fish with small pelvic structures, what do you think you'd get? You'd get a fish with medium pelvic structures. But they also observed a certain asymmetry in the pelvic structures of the fish that they crossed. The orange fish, if you want to think about it that way. This was a key discovery that allowed them to study the regulation of that gene that the freshwater stickleback was talking about. PITX1. Well, that's about all I have to tell you guys about the three spine stickleback. Hopefully, you learned a bit today.